Well, I think that everybody would appreciate that there's very little in the way of therapy for people who have uh, diabetic kidney disease. And the uh, rate of cardiac events is extraordinarily high. And the morbidity once people develop chronic kidney disease is e extreme, um, you know, in terms of health costs, economic costs, social deprivation, etc. So there was a burning platform really to, to do a trial that was going to show some benefit, hopefully some benefit, in patients with, um, you know, a devastating complication of diabetes, which is chronic kidney disease. It was a very simple study design. Uh, basically, it consisted of people with type 2 diabetes over the age of 30 years uh, who were on a stable background dose of ACE inhibitors and uh, or angiotensin receptor blockers, but not both, who had an estimated GFR between 30 and 90 mils per minute, with the study design um, uh, really allowing for 60% of people with an eGFR between 30 and 60 mils per minute, and also albuminuria between 300 and 5,000 milligrams uh, per milligram of creatinine. Um, beyond that, uh, people couldn't have another cause of uh, kidney disease. They couldn't be on dual uh, RAS blockade. They couldn't be hyperkalemic or have had unstable cardiac disease within a month prior to uh, enrolling in the study, and they couldn't have uh, class four heart failure. And they were randomised to a, a one-in-one uh, uh, stratification for canagliflozin, 100 milligrams a day versus placebo, and there was a stratification based on blocks of GFR, so between 30 and 45, 45 and 60, and 60 and 90. And then people were followed up um, every 13 weeks um, once uh, the first three months were over and that alternated with a face-to-face -face, uh, follow-up and a phone follow-up. So it was quite an easy trial to participate in from the participants' perspective. So the primary renal outcome was uh, a composite of end-stage kidney disease, so requiring dialysis or transplantation, a doubling of serum creatinine, renal death or cardiovascular death. And then the secondary outcomes were tested in a hierarchical fashion, and that included uh, cardiovascular death, hospitalisation for heart failure, hospitalisation for heart failure, um, and then just the renal endpoints, and then a, a cardiovascular death and other um, then post hoc and uh, uh, subsequent analyses were done. <coughs> um, so the trial was stopped early in July of last year because the D, uh, there was a pre-specified interim analysis and the DSMB felt so strongly that there was overwhelming evidence in favour of um, the canagliflozin uh, that they, we, we had to stop the trial. Um, so it met its primary endpoint with a 30% reduction in end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine, cardiovascular or renal death, um, which was an enormous uh, you know, benefit on top of uh, you know, background ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So then we moved to the cardiovascular <coughs> endpoints, which was cardiovascular death and hospitalisation for heart failure. And there was a 31% reduction in that endpoint, which was all driven by hospitalisation for heart failure, and there was a 39% reduction in hospitalisation for heart failure. There was also a 20% reduction in three-point MACE, um, but there was a, a, a very strong signal for cardiovascular death, but it didn't reach its primary endpoint. The p-value was 0 0.0502. So after that, we couldn't proceed to any formal uh, further analyses. Look, I think that the major challenge for the trial was really picking um, what the endpoints were and then the ordering of the secondary endpoints um, because it, it was critically important that we did achieve a renal outcome as well as a cardiovascular outcome. And if, in fact, we had reached a cardiovascular outcome before a renal outcome, then we wouldn't have actually had any demonstrable evidence. So there was a lot of discussion in the steering committee around that point. Um, and I think if we hadn't stopped the trial early, it may have been that we would have been able to cascade further down the secondary endpoints and perhaps, but, but 
you know, hypothetically reach an endpoint um, that was positive for cardiovascular death. But I think that, you know, for a patient with diabetic kidney disease, it's absolutely important that they don't end up on dialysis um, for multiple reasons. And when we looked at the rate of progression of kidney disease, it, in the people who were treated with canagliflozin, uh, there was a reduction in renal function of about 1.85 mils per minute of um, kidney or GFR loss per year compared to 4.59 mils per minute per year in the placebo group. So there was a 60% slowing of progression of, of kidney disease. And I think everybody recognises the interplay between kidney disease and heart disease. Um, and I think if you improve the kidneys, you improve the heart. And if you improve the heart, you improve the kidneys. So it was, um, it was a win-win for patients, really. So in the cardiovascular outcome trials that have been done across three different classes of agents for which there's data available, the renal data is remarkably similar in that there's somewhere between a 40 and a 50% reduction in, um, in renal endpoints. And that's important because um, all of those looked at hard renal endpoints um, as opposed to say the GLP agonists where there is positive renal data but that's completely driven by um, a decrease in albuminuria and not driven by preservation of kidney function. So the, um, the three cardiovascular outcome trials that have reported actually enrolled patients with a very low risk of kidney disease. So the average GFR was about 76 and there was um, a urinary albumin excretion on average in the teens, you know, somewhere between 10 and 20. So they were very unlikely to develop kidney failure and in fact across those three outcome trials two of them reported end-stage kidney disease and there was only 29 cases across those three trials um, that we have information for whereas in Credence there was 174 episodes of end-stage kidney disease and it was primarily targeting um, the, the outcome of kidney failure whereas they were secondary analyses very strongly positive and very um, uniform results across those three trials. So I think that um, there's benefit in prevention of kidney disease um, and also benefit in people with established kidney disease. Look, I think it's had enormous impact already and it, the, the trial's only really been published for six months, um, well presented six months actually, it came out in the June um, edition of the New England Journal of Medicine. But I think it's changed uh, guidelines um, such that now it, the um, some European guidelines have actually put SGLT2 inhibitors uh, ahead of metformin in terms of first-line therapy. But I think that most people will be looking for a reason not to use the SGLT2 inhibitors rather than to use them because everybody will be want to want to be on them. I think that um, there's you know there's overwhelming evidence for their benefit and very little in the way of, um, of side effects. So <clears throat> I think people do need to be aware that there is a risk of uh, genitourinary infections, but these are generally very easily treated. Um, there hasn't really been an increase in urinary tract infections, and if anything, in meta-analyses, they're protective of acute kidney injury. So I, I think, uh, particularly as we get um, more comfortable using them and um, looking at, 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 you know, telling people to stop them if they become acutely unwell, which I think is an important issue, uh, and then restarting them once they're better. Uh, I think there's very little reason not to use an SGLT2 inhibitor in anybody with type 2 diabetes. And perhaps when other trials come out in other forms of chronic kidney disease as well, but we have to wait for that data. I think that there's uh, a potential for looking at uh, combination therapies, so I think that people are interested in the combination of SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, for instance. Um, and I think, as I've already mentioned, that there's evidence now for uh, their benefit in, non, in, in people without diabetes but with heart failure. And I think that that um, it then will be extended to other forms of, of disease. So there's lots of trials going on at the moment in metabolic syndrome, um, in various other you know, illnesses, even in things like um, uh, a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. Um, obesity is another area where I think there's you know, strong interest in the drugs. 
So I think it opens up a whole raft of opportunities for um, you know, people with other comorbidities other than type 2 diabetes.